Good afternoon, guys. I am Suhaib Ghani. I'm the lead for the Visualization Go Lab. Welcome to this last and fourth workshop of the Scientific Visualization Workshop Series. Hope you are enjoying the series. So today we will cover 3D reconstruction and rendering using Elastic and Aviso. And our instructor will be Dr. Ronald and Dr. James from my lab. In general, before giving the mic back to Ronald, I just want to say if you have any scientific data that you want to analyze, visualize, and you need any expertise, so please feel free to contact us. Just one advice, try to contact us at the early stage of your project. That will give us more time to give you a better advice. So with that, over to you, Ronald. All right. Thank you, Sohaib. Um, hi, guys. Can you hear me OK? Awesome. So my name is Ronald. Welcome to the workshop. So I'll do the first part of the workshop, um, and my colleague James will do the, the uh, later part. So again, um, I hope uh, you've already installed Aviso, so you have it running right now. Um, so you can follow with the hands-on stuff um, later on. All right. So just quickly, I want to advertise the Kaust Visualization Core Lab. So as Suhaib said, we provide support in data visualization and data science. So we cover a bunch of topics. So if, you're, if you need help with any of these, you can reach out to us. And obviously today, we'll be fo focusing on um, segmentation and 3D reconstruction. Aside from the expertise, we also provide um, visualization facilities. You've probably seen these uh, along the, the spine in building one. So we have large display walls, uh, we have cave displays, and we have new augmented and virtual reality uh, head-mounted displays that you can use. So if you have any interest in using these for your research, let us know. So if you want to know more, visit our uh, wiki. And if you need to reach out to us, you can send an email to that address, OK? Keep that in mind. All right, so before we get into the workshop, I just wanted to quickly give you a uh, preview of the schedule. So I'll spend the first few minutes just giving you an overview of the whole workflow, okay? And um, give a demo for a simple data set. So the goal here is to give you the intuition of what we're doing, okay? And that will be followed by a one hour hands-on session where all of us will go through three or four data sets and really try to uh, perform segmentation and reconstruction on them, okay? We'll have a quick break and then um, so a couple weeks ago, I asked the early registrants if they have any data sets that they could share with me so that we can show it in the workshop. Thank you to all of those who reached out. And I picked uh, three or four examples that we're going to show here. Unfortunately, some of the data sets are not published yet. So uh, for that, I will just do a demo. So I cannot share the data with you. I'll do a demo to show you the different workflows. So I think that would be cool, because if you're at least related to, um, or you have data sets that's similar to their data sets, then you can get some idea of how to deal with your own uh, data sets. Then um, we'll get into Elastic, which is an alternative um, software for doing segmentation. And finally, uh, James will talk about how to run Elastic on IDEX. So this is for cases where you have data sets that are too big that would take uh, days or weeks to run the segmentation on your uh, workstations, okay? So this is our uh, schedule for today, and let's go ahead with the uh, overview. So uh, most of you are here today because you have data sets that kind of look like this, right? So you have image stacks that came from your uh, imaging devices. Could be CT, X-ray, uh, you name it. and you want to perform segmentation, right? And segmentation, the main idea is you want to separate the different materials or different objects in your data so that you can perform some sort of visualization or analysis, right? Now, optionally, you can also perform uh, reconstruction, which basically just generates a mesh or a 3D model uh, that will allow you to do other things. Like um, I'll show you in a bit, you can visualize this in virtual reality uh, for uh, scientific illustrators, you can use this, uh, plug it into your 3D modeling tools and tweak it for your illustrations and so on. But yeah, mainly the goal is to get the segmentation for visualization and analysis purposes, right? And we have different visualization tools. So I'll talk about Aviso today. 
Um, we have other open source uh, alternatives. There's a lot, but some of the ones that we support in the VizLab are PyroView and Visit. So you've probably seen some of the workshops in the past about those. In addition, we can also visualize the data in virtual reality, right? So imagine having a virtual lab walking into your data sets, right? So things like that. We can uh, play around with that. We also have the immersive displays, right? So if you want to see your data in stereo together with some other people, you can use these facilities. Again, reach out to us if you have, if you're just curious or if you have ideas uh, that you want to try. And more importantly, you want to do analysis, right? So now that you've separated the important parts in your data, you want to do some analysis. So for example, this data set from uh, Chow from Anpert, once, they, once he segmented the rock from the core sample, he's able to perform some sort of flow simulation, right? And for Julia, for instance, um, once she's able to segment the axons from the microscopy images, she's able to perform some quantitative um, analysis, right? So measuring the 3D volu volumes, the distribution, et cetera. So yeah, so that's the motivation. You want to do your segmentation so you can do some nice visualization and analysis. Now before I get into the, the workflow demo, I want to talk about something very important, right? So this is more of a conceptual thing. For uh, most of you, this will be obvious, but I, I still wanted to point it out. So you have your uh, data set here, right? And you look, open it on your computer and you see usually like a, a grayscale image, right? Like the one on top. If I take a four by four pixel neighborhood of that, it kind of looks like this, super zoomed in. Now behind the colors that you see are actually numbers, right? So under the hood, your data is just a bunch of numbers that your scanning or imaging devices uh, uh, put out, right? And you have the option to assign a color map in order to see, right, on your screen that data set and kind of make more sense of it. So just as an example, um, using the same data set, the same underlying numerical values, if I use a different color map, your data set will look different, right? Maybe this will allow you to emphasize the, the materials or whatever, but the underlying values are still the same, okay? So now if you apply a filter, for example, or some arithmetic operations, then you can change the underlying values, okay? That's very important. Now our goal in segmentation is to come up with an image that looks like this, right? So for every pixel, you want to assign a numeric value, and this numeric value corresponds to a material or an object. So in this example, let's say one corresponds to air, and two corresponds to sand, right? So our goal is to go from here to there, right? And then once you have that, you can do your analysis there, okay? Now, the process of going from here to there, from your uh, raw data to the segmentation, it's, uh, it can be an, a simple or a complicated process, right? It depends on your data set. So at the worst, worst case scenario, you'll have to go pixel by pixel and assign a label to your data, right? But that's gonna take forever. That's why we have tools that will make this easier uh, and faster for us. And for example, Viso and Elastic are those tools. And that's what we're gonna do today. So I hope that gave you kind of an idea, right? Like at the core, what we're trying to do here. So for the first part, I'm gonna be using Aviso 2022.1. If you have an earlier version, that's also fine. So does everyone have it installed and running? Can you raise your hand maybe if, if you have it running at least? Okay, that's fine. Um, yes, if you need help, so we have Tom and James in the background. Um, if you need help running it or installing or whatnot. Yep. But um, for the first part, I'll just do a demo, okay? So I want you to focus on the screen here so that you kind of get a feeling of how this whole workflow works. And also for those who are not familiar with Aviso, um, maybe this will give you like a little bit uh, better idea of um, how it works, okay? <clears throat> so let me just start Aviso.
and hopefully, if you want to do the hands-on stuff, uh, you should have downloaded the data sets uh, that we provided, okay? All right, so this is the kind of starting page of Aviso. You guys can see the text, hopefully. All right, awesome. So um, for now, as I said, focus on the screen. Um, and yeah. So first, let me open a data set, okay? So you just go to open data. And <clears throat> I think I provided you, uh, okay, the sand data set. So if you go there, you'll see a bunch of images, right? So depending on your uh, imaging device, it can give you like a single file or a stack of images. Um, so here I have a stack of images. I'll just highlight all of them and click open and click OK. So here you can specify like the voxel size um, and the, the unit. For now, I'll choose the default. OK. Um, yeah, sorry, I have that a little bit annoying trial version thing here because we requested for to activate like uh, 30 extra licenses for today just to make sure everyone is uh, supported. Because for Aviso, the, the license that we have for campus, I think it can support around 30 people using it in parallel, okay? So just keep that in mind. Um, but yeah, anyway, so once I open the data set, Aviso right away uh, creates this ortho slice. And the first thing you wanna do, of course, is take a look at your data, right? Get a feeling of what's in your data. How does it look like? Is it noisy? So um, since I have the ortho slice anyway, I'll just go through the slices. So you get a, okay, so you kinda see, okay, there's these super bright things there. Um, another nice thing you can do uh, is use volume rendering. Okay, so you get this more uh, 3D view um, of your data set. And just from these, you can already kind of get a, an idea. Like for me, okay, I want to segment those uh, sand particles away from the void or the air, right? And let me go ahead and try to do that. So I'm gonna click on the data set I want to segment and I'm gonna go to the segmentation editor. So this is what we're mainly gonna be working with today. So it can look a little bit overwhelming, but we'll, we're gonna go through this um, together. So you have here the views of your uh, data along uh, the different um, planes, x, y, y, z, x, z. Um, and then you have here, oh, okay. All right, so you have here uh, a list of material. Right, so these are the different objects that are that you think are in your data. Sorry, let me just fix my mouse. So it's very important to have a mouse because, yeah, you're gonna be brushing. It's hard to do on the mouse pad. So here you, we have your materials. So let's say um, I just rename this to sand, and let's say air. Okay, so now. Let's say first, I want to segment the, the sand, right? So it looks to me that there's, I mean, I'm the supposedly the domain scientist and I kind of should know about my data, but for this one, my guess is that if I use thresholding, right, I should be able to separate the air from the sand. So thresholding, I mean, for those of you who are not familiar with it, if you see here on the bottom, thresholding allows you to specify like a minimum and maximum value that you want to select, right? So in this case, for example, um, Aviso even automatically set this value here or this range based on the histogram of the data. If you look at the histogram here, there's kind of the, these two peaks, right? Roughly corresponding to the sand and air intensity values, okay? But what you're gonna notice is if you zoom in here, for example, I'm not sure if you see it, but there's some particles kind of in the air that get included uh, into the sand, right? Into the sand selection. And that's because of the noise in the data. So, I mean, I, I can show you here first. Let's try to segment it just like this. So what I'm gonna do, again, I'm just showing you this now. We'll go through this step by step later. So what I'm gonna do, um, let's say I'm happy with this selection or with this range. I click select mass voxel and that will highlight, okay? the the region that I that I'm interested in right now. 
and I'm going to say, okay, now I'm going to add it to the sand material. So I have to press this plus button, okay? So now it's been put into the sand material, and now I'm going to select the, the air, um, the air particle. So I'm just going to change the threshold here. So now I want to select those pixels with values from zero to 7,000, okay? And if I click this, boom, now it's highlighting these parts. And now, okay, I want to click air, and let me add those to air. I'm done with the segmentation, right? I mean, it's not perfect, but I'm done. So if I want to preview this, actually, so here's the sand, and here is the air. But as you can see, it's, it's noisy, right? Yeah. So what I'm going to do is, if you remember the, the picture that I showed you before with the 4x4 four four pixels, <coughs> what I'm going to do now is before doing, or I'm going to iterate, right? So first, I'm going to clean up my data. So let me just turn this off. I'm going to clean up my data and apply a filter to it. So this will change the values. So I'm going to use a median filter. So there's a bunch of filters that you can use in Aviso. We don't have time to go through them today, but median filter is usually a popular uh, choice. So if you now look, um, if you now look here, so I'm not sure if you saw that, but the, the noise kind of magically disappeared. And now if I go back to segmentation and do the thresholding again, I have to create a new label field. So it starts off from scratch. Again, sand. Yeah? So now you don't see the, the noise here anymore, right? And if I just now select, I mean, it's much, much cleaner and nicer, right? And let's again just add that to sand. And just like before, change the, oh, no. Yeah. Boom, okay, so now I'm done, and if you look here, I hope it's clear, but it's, it's very clean, right? So this is a super simple example of kind of the process of um, doing segmentation. So now once you're done with your segmentation, um, so you can visualize it, for example, using voxelized rendering, okay, so here, or, um, so that's one, if you want to see it in 3D, and, I mean, let's say, so by the way, this was presented by my colleague Tom in the introduction to Aviso workshop, um, so yeah, so now I can just turn on and off like different materials to see the, the structure that I'm interested in, okay? And finally, you can do different types of analysis, okay? So I won't show that here. We'll go to that later. Um, okay, so actually, one last thing. Um, you can also generate a 3D model for this one, right? It's super easy, so I'm just gonna show that to you. So if you click here, um, look for the generate surface module and just click apply you get your 3d model so if i now okay All right so now i mean it looks similar but this is a 3d model so it's a triangulated mesh so you can now export this to other software for example that you can edit or do some other analysis okay so that was kind of the, the workflow so yes Yeah. 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 So I have one example later um, that is kind of like that. Um, it's going to be interpreted as a multi channel uh, image. So the R, G, and B channels will be separated, and you can work with them separately. Yeah. Of course, yeah. Um, yes, and I mean, Aviso is 
pretty powerful. So there's different uh, computational tools here. Um, I don't even know all of them, but for example, like if you want to get the histogram, right? So you just type histogram here, you have different options. Then like for example, let me run this for you because it's really quick. Boom, right, so you have this. Oh, so I ran it on the segmentation, so it just shows me two values. But yeah, there's a lot of tools here for analysis, so we'll see some of them later. So that was the workflow, right? And this is uh, an example, like if I'm a geoscientist and I wanted, I did a scan of some sand samples and I want to characterize them, this is what I was, what I am gonna do. Okay, so now I want you to try this out yourself. I mean, we'll go through the, the thing step by step, but maybe a bit more quickly. Um, so if you have a Aviso on, so let me just start from scratch again. All right, so if you have a Aviso on, so you'll see this, okay, and then open data. Then go to the sand data set folder, control A and open. And then just click okay. Okay, so now that you're here, if you want, I mean, you can go through the slices or use volume rendering. So if you click on the, <coughs> on the object here, there's some suggested modules that you can try here. So volume rendering, for example, is right there. And just to save some time, since we already know, would be nice to, to filter the data. So again, click here and then just look for median filter. So if you're not familiar with Aviso, if you click on the data object you want to process, there's a kind of this circle icon on the right. If you click that, then you can search for the module you want to attach to it. So let's say median filter, and then you can just click apply. So if you're interested in knowing more about the details, okay, of the different, um, like modules in Aviso, there's this question mark button here. So in case you want to know like the underlying algorithm and the parameters, you can look into that, right? All right, so once you've filtered the data, so click the filtered data, and then go click the segmentation icon, uh, button here. So is everyone here now? Um, and then here, as I said, you have here your list of materials, right? And you can add or delete uh, materials here. So in this case, I mean, you can name it whatever you want. In my case, I just want sand and air. In your case, again, it depends on your data set and you can have many materials. Um, and then, okay, just to give you kind of a brief tour of the, the user interface, you have here the different tools for segmentation, right? So these are your friends. But in my experience, I usually just use the brush. So the brush kind of allows you to manually select regions, right? So this is like the manual process. Um, so you can select um, and then add. So this is another important concept that I, I maybe forgot to emphasize. So when you're brushing or selecting stuff on your images or selecting regions, it doesn't get added to the material right away, right? You have to click this plus button here. It's a bit confusing. And also there's this add button here, right? Like it's, it's also confusing. But yeah, just keep that in mind. So when you brush or highlight or whatever, it's not added to the material until you click plus. So here I'll click plus and that will disappear and it's, it's added to the sand material, okay? And if you want to preview your material so far, you can click on this 3D button here. Let me just change the color so you can change the color so it's more visible, all right? 
Okay. So again, we'll go to the thresholding, so this icon here. And then I'll just accept Aviso's uh, suggestion. <clears throat> and so there's two things, right? So one, you see here the highlights in blue. Again, this is a bit of a confusing thing. The highlights in blue are the ones that fall within the threshold range, okay? They're not selected yet. So if I click plus here, nothing's gonna happen. I have to highlight them first or select, so I have to click this button. And now they're highlighted. Again, I have to click the plus button, right? Sorry if I'm repeating this a lot, but these are the basics, right? And later when we go to more complex stuff, you'll have to know this by heart. Okay, so now again, thresholding. <coughs> Can select. And then add. Okay. All right. No, no, there's no automatic, but what I usually do is copy, paste the threshold, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, 2D, X, Y. So there's 3D here. Um, it's faster. <laughs> But it depends, right? So again, so this is a very important thing. Thank you for asking. The, the choices you make in terms of the parameters, the modules you're gonna use, the tools you're gonna use, it depends on your data. So here, I just use a, a filter that operates in XY because it's a simple data set. I could have used 3D actually. Maybe it will give me better results. I'm not sure, but you have to try it. So that's the thing, right? So there's many different paths that you can uh, go through to get your segmentation. And there's no like one perfect solution, yeah? So you have to try things out. All right, so. Uh, oh, cool, we still have time. Um, all right, so is everyone, did everyone get their first segmentation done today on the SAN data set? For those who are doing the hands-on. Everyone's okay? Are there any other questions? So that was the basics of it, okay? And uh, just another quick thing. Um, so if you can go back and forth, right? Bet uh, between segmenting, pre-processing your data. So it's an iterative process. And now let's say I wanna go back to the segmentation again. You just click your data and click the segmentation editor. Very important, if you're dealing with many segmentation iterations already, sometimes uh, a visa will pick the wrong one. So make sure you pick the correct one here, okay? And you can create a new one if you're not happy. I wanna create a new one and it starts from scratch, okay? All right, so for now, we're done with the SAN data set, all right? Everyone okay with that? Okay, so we're gonna move on to the second data set. So for this one, I will give you some time to play around with it on your own, right? So let me just uh, clear everything here. So can you please open the Coral data set? So this is from uh, our friend Domingo from Anpart. So if you go to the data sets folder, there's a Coral data set here. Um, so if you just open that, okay. So, I mean, I'll just show you the volume rendering here because it's, it's a really cool data set. So, I, I downsampled this a lot, so I reduced the, the size because the original one is uh, pretty big and for those of us with just a uh, like simple laptop, it might take forever to process, so you're dealing with a smaller data set. So what I want you to do is just play around with the data set and try to do, it's a simple data set, but I want you to get the feel of uh, doing the segmentation on your own. And if you have questions, let us know. And it's up to you if you wanna segment one material, two materials, three materials. 
So I give you five minutes, <laughs> and then I'll, I'll show you how I'll do it. It's a super simple data set. Just want you to get a, a try on your own. <clears throat> All right. So as I said, it's a pretty simple data set. And with just thresholding, you could get some nice results, depending on what you need. So in my case, I mean, just to show you how I do it, uh, I'll use the thresholding tool. And again, Aviso <laughs> suggests some nice uh, threshold to separate kind of the, the dense regions from kind of the lighter regions. So when I say dense here, it de depends on your uh, uh, imaging device. So for example here, the, the dense parts get a brighter uh, pixel or higher pixel value. That's why they're, they're brighter here. So if I just select that, boom, right? I mean, super easy. And now I can click plus. And then um, as Steve asked before, so now I want to select the rest. What I'm going to do is just copy this threshold value here, paste it there, and then adjust, right? And now here, so this is another question. How do you decide on the minimum value here? Well, it's up to you. So you are the domain expert. Um, unfortunately, I mean, it's, it's up to you most of the time. So you have to decide on like what's the proper value to use here. So for this, again, it's a simple data set. Um, so I can just base it on the histogram here and say, okay, about here. Boom, and then select light. Don't forget to switch to the other material and click plus, okay? And I'm done, right? I mean, super easy. Again, we're starting with the easy data sets. Later, we'll get to more complicated ones. And again, if you just want to visualize that, uh, click your label here and then choose voxelized rendering. So you see it here. And let's say I want to do like a simple analysis. Like I want to measure, okay, let's say how many percent of this, this coral data set belongs to the dense material versus the soft. So I can do, um, there's a module here called um, volume fraction. So if I just do that and click apply, it will count, okay? It will count the number of voxels for the dense and the lighter material and give it to me. So here you have the number, right? So you can kind of, if you need that in your analysis, for example, you can just do it and it's there, right? Okay. So, any questions so far? Again, this is a simple data set, but it's beautiful, right? And I mean, I guess it, it depends on your materials that you're scanning. You can get lucky, right? And that segmentation just means thresholding, okay? So thresholding works really well, as you can imagine, for data sets where the materials are distinctly separated in terms of the intensity value, okay? <clears throat> All right, so I wanna move on. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next data set, if that's okay with you. So you have the data sets with you, so you can play around with them uh, later on. So I'm just gonna start with an empty project. And now, I'm gonna open the, uh, let me check, where, bottle. Can we open the bottle? The bottle data set. Okay, so for this data set, I wanna talk about the watershed algorithm. So Tom kind of um, demonstrated this tool in his um, intro to Avisa workshop, um, but I wanted to uh, reiterate it and um, give a slightly different flavor of explanation for it because it's a very important tool, okay? So thresholding, that's one of my go-tos. First thing I will try, and then watershed. So what does watershed do? Um, let me demonstrate it first, and then I will explain because it's kind of a little bit complicated to explain, okay? So again, I'm gonna click the data set and then go to segmentation. 
okay, I forgot. First, you want to look at your data, right? Like, what is my data set about? So if you look at the slices, maybe it doesn't give you much. But if you do uh, volume rendering, and from the name itself, it's a bottle cap, right? So you have the cap and the bottle in here, okay? I hope it's obvious from here. And you want to separate, or in this scenario, I want to separate the cap from the bottleneck. bottleneck. Um, all right, so again, I'll go back to my segmentation editor. Actually, maybe you're curious. You want to try thresholding, right? Because it looks like the intensity values are quite different. And you have these, like, if you look at the histogram, you kind of have these different peaks over here, right? So you can actually do that. So if I do this, for example. Yeah, let's just try that. Okay, let me try that. Um, okay. Oh. So if you look here, so this looks perfect, right? This looks really good. But if you look at the other one, see some of the bottleneck gets captured. It's because the, <clears throat> like especially on the interface, so where these, the, the cap and the bottleneck uh, meet, the intensity values there I've kind of messed up, right? So in these cases where the, in the boundaries, it's kind of difficult to separate the materials, that's where I would use watershed. Okay, and now, okay, let me create a new one. Now I'm gonna use watershed, okay? So let me first demonstrate it to you and then I'll explain. So let's create the cap, bottle, air. Let me change the color. All right. So first what I'm gonna do is use the brush to make some make a few samples for each uh, material, okay? So you can follow, follow along if you want. <clears throat> um, so I would zoom in, and let's say for, for the cap first. Um, so you see the, so I'm using the brush, so it's this icon here, and you'll see kind of the, the cursor here with the circle, that's the size of your brush. So if you wanna make it smaller, you can use these buttons here, or you can click control and use the mouse wheel to adjust it. So I'm just gonna carefully brush here. So I'm gonna take a few samples. Oops. So if you make a mistake, you can press control Z, which is nice. So again, I'm just highlighting here. We're not adding anything yet. So just take couple of, so I'll add it to the cap. I'll get more samples here. Okay, so it's nice to get samples kind of spread out. All right, so that's for the cap. For the bottle, I'll do the same. So just a bunch of brush strokes. Add, and for the air, very easy. So just the black regions. All right. Okay, so now that I've done that, right? So I've created like in a matter of like one minute, I just created some brush strokes, super easy to do. And now I go here to this watershed algorithm and just click apply, okay? So there's a pop-up here that's gonna ask you if you want to create a gradient image. Just click yes, I want to create a gradient image and I'll explain why in a little bit. And then it's just gonna do its magic, right? And then let's see what we get from there. And just like that, I get something. It's not perfect. You see there's this 
erroneous region here. So what I'm gonna do, I just go back to my brush stroke from before and <coughs> add more here. All right, and then do it again. And this should give me an okay result, right? And it, there you go. Boom, right? Magical. So now, oh, so I have to take care of that. <coughs> yeah, so that's the thing, right? I mean, the, the algorithm, as again, I will explain in a bit, depends on also your initial brush strokes where you provide them. So you kind of, I mean, it's not a lot. It would take probably just a few seconds or a few minutes. Um, but it's really nice. And I mean, we'll, we'll use it again for a more complicated example later. Um, but I just wanna show you this and then explain how it works. Yeah, so I mean, I'll, I'll do, you can do this more later, but now I kind of, now you see it's separated the cap from the bottle, right? I mean, I can clean this up later by adding more brush strokes there for the air and the bottle is nicely separated, okay? Now, how does this work? So before I go into the explanation, I wanna show you this picture, okay? So this is kind of a super nice illustration of the watershed algorithm, okay? And on the left here is the before applying the watershed algorithm, and on the right is after. And if you see the color label stuff there, that's the brush strokes that we did in the beginning, okay? So, and this gray thing that you see here, it's the gradient image that it asks us to compute. So, um, the gradient image, you can think of it as, uh, it computes the difference between pixels in your data, and it has high values where there are edges, where there's a big difference or big jump in the, in the intensity value, okay? So that's kind of the, where the, the peaks are, that's the edges in your data. And once you provided these brush strokes, when you click apply, it's as if it's, it's think of these as like faucets. And you turn on the, the faucet, water comes out, they flood the region, and eventually it becomes like this, right? And the area or the part where the two kind of, um, the, the, the different water or different uh, materials meet, that's kind of where it's gonna separate your different materials. So that's pretty clever. So it, it I mean, for, for a lot of data sets, this works super nicely. And I'll, I'll show that in a later example. So this is the idea of the watershed. And that's why like, uh, if you miss providing like some, some initial brush strokes to, the, to this material, for example, like what happened to me here, it's gonna miss it, right? It's, not, it's gonna be flooded by a different material. Make sense? I hope it makes sense. I love this algorithm. Um, all right, and again, you can play around with this um, later on. And we'll see this later, okay? Yeah? Yeah. So you can have different modalities, like CT, for example. Oh, this one, probably CT. Like, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um, if you're curious why people do this, I mean, because they can. <laughs> no, and here I think they want to analyze the interface. Um, yeah. But yeah, anyway, so that's watershed and we'll see this again later. So you'll probably notice I'm introducing you slowly to the tools over here, right? So <clears throat> there's different tools for segmentation. So far we've seen the brush, the threshold and watershed. I won't talk about everything. So later I'll talk about the texture classification. If you're interested about the others, uh, I did a, a video before that explains all of them. So you can look into those. Um, and you can just search it on YouTube. <laughs> like search, you can search for Kaos Visualization Core Lab. We have a YouTube page. 
All right, anyway, so that was the watershed algorithm. I hope that made sense to you. Great algorithm, okay? Um, all right, so now, let me check the time. Perfect. So I'll start again from scratch. We'll move on to the another data set. So now can you please open the heart, heart data set. All right. So these are heart tissue. Uh, it's a heart tissue data set. I'm not a domain expert. This is from um, like Thermo Fisher. So they have this example in YouTube actually, if you want to follow it. But it's a really nice example for texture classification. <coughs> so, I mean, is there anyone who's like an expert in this field? Good. <laughs> so I'm not an expert in this field, um, but I mean, I'm just gonna base what we're gonna do today based on the Aviso tutorial. So the, the objects or materials that we want to segment here are these bright regions here, which is apparently mitochondria. Then you have these, this kind of dark stripy region, and this blurry region here, and the dark regions there. So we have one, two, three, four. Okay, now, I mean, let me show you the different slices. So if I ask you to segment this, just with the tools that we have so far, what are you gonna use? It's hard to choose, right? I mean, with the thresholding, I mean, 100%, it's not gonna work, right? Because the, um, let's say the intensity values are not enough to distinguish between the different uh, materials. And for many of you, your data sets might be like this, right? If you're <coughs> scanning like very complex um, organisms or um, materials. And I mean, if we do a volume rendering just to get an idea of the structures, it's complicated, right? It's not like you have this clear separated thing that you want to pull out, okay? And this is where um, I would say that texture uh, classification tool can work well, okay? So again, we go to the segmentation editor and we have our usual views. Sorry, let me. So sometimes accidentally, <laughs> so by default you have this um, button. If you click on the data set, it will select everything. So just this button here, it clears whatever is highlighted or selected, okay? So let me just clear that. <clears throat> All right, so this is the texture classification um, uh, tool. So what it does is um, you basically have to give it a few examples of what you're looking for, right? So, and for that you can use the brush, thresholding, uh, whatever. So you brush on the image here and then you just click apply, right? And what it will do is it will learn, right? It's, it's doing some form of machine learning, right? Very, not very complex, but very um, simple, I would say. And it tries to figure out um, how to um, distinguish the different materials based on the samples you gave it. So the result depends on the quality of your samples that you give it and the quantity. So in general, the more the better. I mean, just like in complex deep learning uh, solutions, right? So for now, uh, let me first um, create the materials. So you can follow uh, if you want. This is pretty uh, simple. And 100% all of us will get different results, right? Because it depends on your unique brush strokes. So because I don't know the name of the materials, I'll just keep the default. <laughs> So for the mitochondria, I'll use the brush and just brush here. So you can do this on your computer as well. So you'll notice I'm trying to go closely to the edges. So this is very important so that the tool um, learns how to separate materials on the boundaries, okay? 
So this process, it's up to you how much time you have, how much patience you have. Um, so for this workshop, I'm going to do not a lot. Okay, and then this region here. And you might ask, like, how do I know where to brush? So you're going to be the domain scientist, right? So you're going to know about your data. Um, and ideally, you should know what you're doing. <laughs> All right. So. And this is fun. I mean, like, if you get bored of this, uh, you can think of it as a game, right? Like, you're trying to get the best segmentation out of your uh, data. And it's a mystery, because sometimes you have to use different combinations of filters, different pre-processing, post-processing, different techniques. All right. OK. So let's say I'm happy with the selection that I made, right? So Aviso will use this selection here for training. And then it's going to segment everything else. So I'm going to click this texture classification. All right. There's a bunch of parameters here, okay? I'm not going to go through all of them. If you're interested, you should click on this question mark to see kind of the, the explanation for the different parameters, okay? Okay, so one nice feature is that there's this compute preview button here. If you click that, it will show you a preview of the segmentation you're going to get just on one slice. All right. So, and what that allows you to do is if you say like, oh, I'm not happy with this. I think it needs more sample. Then you can just go back to the brush, add more sample and so on. Okay. And let's say I'm happy with this for now and I click apply. This should take a couple of seconds. In the meantime, I want to show you this picture. So for those of you who are not familiar with the um, texture-based classification, this is just kind of an illustration that you'll find in Aviso's documentation, right? So for us humans, it's kind of easy, right, to distinguish different patterns. So these patterns are basically just the, the texture, right? But, but for a computer, you have to teach it to distinguish these patterns. If you just use thresholding, as I've been showing you before, it's not going to work, right? Like, it's going to get like something messed up. But once you get like a really good model, then it can like really uh, separate the different uh, textures nicely. But there's a lot of factors involved, right? OK, so it's still computing. So this takes some time. That's why the preview is very helpful. So you can get a quick feeling of what the result will be. Awesome. All right. Um, yeah, so this is the result. Uh, I don't like these in the middle, right? Like, I don't think they should be there. Um, but for the other materials, it's pretty good, right? So if I preview the mitochondria here, uh, let me change the color. Yeah, it's really, really good in terms of that kind of texture. But for the others, it's not. And that's where I would go back and try to tweak the different parameters here, right? So I would go back again to my brush strokes. OK, so let me So this is kind of uh, something that I don't really like, but you have to. So you have to always go back to that slice where you have your brush strokes. Otherwise, the preview will not work, OK? So what I can do, for example, is change the radius here. So this radius is, um, OK, so, so for the, the classification to work, you have to give it a radius of the pixel neighborhood to use for computation. Uh, and you have to play around with this, OK? So let me just make a guess. No. Yeah. 
See, so now, because I made the, the ranges bigger, it, when it's doing the computations, it's considering more, like a bigger neighborhood when, when trying to decide. And now you see like the small dots kind of disappeared here. And hopefully, I mean, when I apply it again, um, it's gonna get better results. Let me just check the time. Oh, cool, we still have time. So I'll do that. The other important parameter that I kind of really like is this uncertainty. So this uncertainty threshold, um, the lower you, you turn it, so it was three before, now it's one, the more, uh, what to say, the more strict it is, right? If it's not sure about a certain pixel, it's not gonna label it. So if you look at the preview here, it's not completely label, labeled, right? Some is, I mean, let me zoom in. Yeah, some is left behind. So it's because it's unsure, okay? And there's actually, in many cases, that's a good thing because it's not sure, let it be. Leave it be and then we can use watershed to fill in the gaps. So I will do just that now because this is something that I, I really like and I, I mean, I've used it with some complex data and I get really, really good results. So I'll do that now. I'm running the texture classification again with a more, with a lower uncertainty threshold, so it's more strict. And you'll see the result, there's some gaps. But now, even if I have those gaps, if you remember the watershed, right? I mean, imagine now that these labels are the ones that the texture classification generated for me, but there's some gaps. So if I use watershed now, boom, it's gonna fill it up, then you get some hopefully really nice segmentation. That's what I'm gonna show. So this is a nice example of mix, mix and match, right? So mixing and matching different tools. Yeah. <clears throat> and what my goal for today is to give you that intuition, right? What are these tools, the brushing, thresholding, watershed, texture classification? To give you an idea how these work and later on try to figure out what works best for your data. All right, so here's the result. It's still not perfect, but again, go back, you iterate, add more brush strokes, rerun it, change the parameters, okay? If you've done deep learning stuff before, it's a familiar process for you. But now let's say I'm happy with this, right? But again, there's those gaps that I wanna fill in. So what am I gonna do? I click watershed, and click apply. Again, it's gonna ask if I want to compute the gradient image. Yes, please. And now it's gonna fill up those gaps. And when I show you the 3D uh, structures, it's gonna look, uh, so you see here, right? I mean, look at that. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see the detail, but it's, it's really beautiful. Um, and now let's just look at the mitochondria. Really nice. Um, anyway, so let me just check the schedule. All right, so surprisingly we're ahead of time. Um, maybe I'm going too fast, but are there any questions right now? Really cool, right? I hope you share the <laughs> Um, all right. Oh, what, why do I always do it here? Oh yeah, very good question. So it's actually totally up to you, right? So I mean, actually that's a really, really good point, right? So you have the option to choose the slice where you want to work on. And ideally, it's a slice where all the materials are nicely um, presented, right? Like you have all of them because the, the preview only works on one slice. Um, and you can actually provide brush strokes on multiple slices. It's fine, right? Um, actually, in like a recent project that I was working on, 
Um, so I first did brush strokes on the XY slice. So that's kind of natural because your imaging usually does, does the images along XY. But let me just, you can actually brush on the other planes. And in some cases, okay, in, I mean, in, in the example that I was working with today, that gave me like, I don't know, two times much better results. So what that means is like you can actually go here and brush, right? And brush on these regions, right? So maybe, maybe from the different uh, like perspective, you see the structure more. And there are cases where that's true. That's a very good question. So yes, you have the freedom to, to pick whatever slice you want to use. Um, and of course, if you think that you want to uh, filter this image, like you think it's noisy, go ahead, like go back to the project view, apply a filter to your raw data. Sometimes the, the filtering, like denoising, helps improve the, the texture classification result. Okay, so again, it's an art, right? There's some art to it. Um, but the important thing is you understand your data and you know the tools that are available to you, okay? And I mean, I personally don't know all the tools available in Aviso, but there's a user guide here. You can look up something. So if you wanna look for a filter, for example, <coughs> Maybe it will work, <laughs> but um, if you have, um, okay, that's weird that it's not working. Oh, okay. Oops. Yeah, let's give it some time. Okay, there, so now it gives you like a bunch of things, right? And I mean, Google is your friend. You Google something, Aviso, whatever, it will show you something. If not, let us know, right? Like, that's what we're here for. So we, we provide support for Aviso. Yeah. Yes. So, um, yes, you can. So these uh, label fields, right? They're just data sets, right? If you look under the hood, these are just, again, images with the integer values. And you can perform, uh, I mean, you can filter them if you want, if that makes sense to you. You can uh, manipulate them. So there's a, an arithmetic module in Aviso. And okay, combining them for sure is, is doable. I'm not sure now how I would do that. Yeah, there's a way. I mean, in the arithmetic, using the arithmetic module, for sure there's a way. I mean, we can talk about that uh, afterwards, um, but it's doable. Yes, so there's a, um, I think I'll show one example later. Um, I haven't done it, well, I mean, we can search it, and, but I'm pretty sure. Yeah, here, connected components, yeah. So that's another strategy. So I usually, if I'm looking for something, just click on your target data set, click this, and search for the keyword. That's super nice. Like um, core, core network model, right? There was a question, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. So that's a super nice question. So we have an example later. Okay, maybe it's different. Um, but there's a, a, a module in Aviso that allows you to align, um, align your data set, for example, and you can stitch them together if you want. So that's one solution. Um,
Oh, I think there's two options. I'll show you that as well uh, later. There's two options. Um, I think that, yeah, after the break, I'll show one example of that where we do alignment, right? So um, we, we can have data sets where the slices are not completely aligned. And you'll notice that when you go through the, ortho, uh, the slices in the ortho slice module, the stuff is kind of jumping around, right? And then you can auto align it and there's two options uh, I'll show you later. All right, so are there any other questions? So we have 15 minutes before the break. Mm. Yes, that's a good question, right? So first of all, just a quick comment, right? There are cases like this, and I've seen some cases like that, where even for even a, a human, right, it's hard to distinguish. So if it's hard for a human, most likely it's gonna be hard for the computer. But anyway, for your case, if there's some shape uh, involved and the intensity values are kind of similar, maybe there's a way. So in Aviso, there are modules that can enhance features based on shape. So, um, for example, uh, if you know your materials are like spherical or circular, I would run that filter and on my image, everything that's circular will, will get like a higher value, okay? So I have that image. Then I can use that image to guide my segmentation later, right? So this is an example where maybe you do the segmentation on an image that was computed from your raw data, right? So your raw data is hard to distinguish the stuff. I apply a filter that enhances the spherical uh, objects, and then I do my segmentation on that. Okay, I mean, we can talk about this uh, offline. So yeah, anyway, let's go for a 10 minute break uh, right now. So there's coffee and stuff outside. All right, um, good news, we're five minutes ahead of schedule, yay. So anyway, um, I hope everyone's back from the coffee break. So for the next um, 20, 25 minutes, I wanna show some uh, example workflows for data sets that were uh, shared to me by some Kauth users. So unfortunately, I cannot share the data set with you guys because this is, this is unpublished. But I wanted to show you some examples, right, of how one might deal with the, the data. Again, what I'm gonna show you is not like the only solution, right? Like it just turns out for these data sets. Um, this is the workflow I came up with. You might come up with your own. Um, and some people approached me during the break with their own like data sets and, and problems, right? Uh, and please do that, right? After the workshop, if, you're, um, if you think you need more, um, reach out to us. Uh, that's part of our job to, to help you with that. So, okay, so now I'm gonna go into this um, next example. So it's a, a CT scan of a, a core plug, right? So this is uh, basalt, I think. Um, and for this, I just wanna segment uh, I mean, if you look at the slice over here, uh, I wanna segment the basalt and maybe this bright mineral plus the voids. Um, so let me just do a volume rendering to kind of uh, give you a preview of the data set. So sometimes you'll get this if you do volume rendering. So all you have to do um, is adjust the color map over here. Um, so if you go back to this color map idea I showed before, you assign a color uh, in volume rendering, you assign a color and transparency to the intensity values, right? Um, and if, for example, here I just move this um, to the right, what that says is like everything to the left of this range, make it transparent, right? Because I don't wanna see that. Um, and then you see this structure. Of course, for this one, it's a simple uh, data set. For more complex ones, you might have to fiddle with the color map more. But for us, this is fine, right? So with this, it already lets me see the data set quite nicely. Um, and actually, this data set is super 
simple to, to uh, segment. Uh, as you can imagine, if I just use thresholding, it's gonna work. Um, but one thing I wanted to show you, by the way, that's not always the case, right? But what I want to show you is, um, okay, so let me first go to the segmentation editor <coughs> and zoom out a bit. All right. Okay. So, all right, let me just add the material. So if I do thresholding, um, so again, look at the histogram here, right? So we have these uh, different peaks that probably means something. So you can check it out. So let's try to get this. This is probably the basalt, yeah? And here, the, the boundary part here is a bit tricky. So again, it's up to you to decide where to put this. Um, let's say I'm okay here. And also, I told you like there's these minerals that I want to segment. So let me just turn off the preview here. Can you see that small thing here? I mean, let me zoom in. Yes. So here, just because I, I mean, for some reason, maybe for, for my analysis, I want to segment these parts as well. But as you can see, because the intensity value is very clearly different from the basalt, I can just use segmentation, right? Okay. Um, so I will do this. Yeah. All right. And select. And if, yeah. You will see it here. So actually, for this data set, it's already super nice just with thresholding. But in some cases, right, like the, the boundary might be tricky, right? Because if you look uh, closely, at the boundary, um, sometimes uh, the, the, the material gets mixed up with the boundary, right? And for that, what I want to show is that you can actually crop out a region of your data set. Um, or in some cases, for example, um, for some reason, uh, there's a part uh, of the data that's uh, corrupted, right? So you wanna crop that out. So I just wanna tell you that you can crop your data, right? So that's the main point of this thing. So there's a volume edit um, module. Okay, and you can choose different shapes that you can use to crop out data. And for these core plugs, the cylinder makes sense, right? And you want to align it along the Z axis, and boom. Now you can um, basically crop out and I'll show you why this is, oops, <coughs> why this is nice in a little bit. In some cases, it, it makes the, the analysis and segmentation more accurate. <coughs> so once you're happy with the selection, you can just say cut outside And then, boom, you have this. Um, let me just turn off that. So now everything outside is, is zero, right? So in some cases, maybe you're, you have a region of interest that you want to segment. Everything else you don't care. You can use this volume edit uh, tool, okay? So anyway, now let me just quickly show you the segmentation because it's super easy. Again, I'll use the thresholding and just add, so let me just call this basalt. Done, right? And then, uh, once again, I'll copy this, paste it here, then go the other side. And now I'm trying to get like the higher density minerals, select them. And you see kind of here, for example, if you want to do some analysis on how these minerals are distributed, you can do that. So just visually, you see it here already. Then I will just add it. Yeah, so I can show you in the next, <coughs> the next one. So let's say I'm done, right? And let me just 
show you that exactly. Because, um, yeah, now that you have your segmentation, now what, right? Yes, you can visualize it in a nice way, but even better, um, you can do um, analysis on it, right? So what do you want to measure? If you just want to measure the, the volume of the basalt and the minerals in total, <coughs> you can use the one that I showed before, the volume fraction. If you want individual mineral volumes, um, I'm not sure if it will work here, but there's a label analysis module. Let's see what happens here. I'm gonna show this in a later uh, example, by the way. I'm not sure if it's gonna work with the multiple materials. Usually I apply this to a binary uh, segmentation. Yeah, so, yeah, okay. So it's not what I expected. So this one just gave me like the two materials, right? So what you want to do, if you want to, for example, just measure the the, the 3D volume of the individual minerals. Let's try that actually. And this is kind of related to what uh, Domingo was asking earlier. So now <coughs> I have this segmentation with uh, the basalt and the minerals. Let me just extract the minerals from that, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create an arithmetic module. So the arithmetic module, you can put in as input here, I guess, up to three data sets. And then you can create an expression here, a mathematical expression, and then it will output the result. So in this case, uh, A is my basalt segmentation. If I just wanna extract the minerals, I would do something like A equals equals two. So this just means, so this is a logical, uh, well, kind of a logical operation. So if the value of a is equal to two, output a one. If not, output a zero. So if I click apply, yes. So now I have the segmentation of only the minerals, right? So let me show you. Yeah. And now if we do the analysis on this one, it should give us uh, label analysis, okay. So it will give us like the 3D volume of each mineral part separately, right? So you'll see that in a bit. And what I wanted to add while this is running is if you want to create your custom analysis, custom measurement, you can actually do that, okay? I won't show that here, but it, it's possible. All right, so we actually have it here. And let me show you this nice, so we get two outputs. One is this, so each separate uh, mineral is assigned a unique, well, is assigned a color, so you can see the separation. And you get this table over here. So each row in this table corresponds to the measurements for each uh, object here, okay? And this is super nice. So we have the area, volume, and so on, okay? All right. So that was it for this example, okay? And again, there's other types of measurements and analysis that I won't be able to show, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so um, the locations are here. So there's buyer center X, Y, Z. So this is kind of the average if you average out the XYZ positions of all the voxels. There's also a way, I think, if you click here and click here, it will show you where the object is, okay? As a CSV file, okay? Very good, so I'll move on to the next example. Um, yes, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Very good question. I mean, this is actually 
super important, right? And I, I forgot to mention that. So you see here, we have uh, essentially three materials. And by default, you cannot delete this. It's there by default. There's an exterior material. And Aviso by default assigns this to zero. Okay, keep that in mind. That's very important. And then the rest is just one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Very good question. That's how I knew that if I wanted to extract the, this material three, it's the label values are equal to zero, one, two. It's equal to two. Okay? Very good question. All right. Um, and then I'll move on to the next data set. By the way, I mean, for example, uh, you want to analyze the, here I showed you how to analyze the minerals. For some people, they want to analyze the pores, right? How, how are the pores distributed? What are the sizes and so on? So you can do that in a similar way. All right, let's move on to the next data set. <clears throat> so the next one is the axons from uh, Julia. Not sure if she's here. Thank you for sharing the data set. So, um, nice. All right, so this is, when you load the data, you kind of notice there's this, I mean, usually you just get one box, right? For this one, you get four. And that's because this data set has three channels, right? So if you're using some, um, <coughs> um, what kind of microscopes would give you this? Fluorescence. Fluorescence microscope, right? So it can give you multiple channels. And um, here, so the top one is just kind of a, a placeholder for everything. And then you have the different channels here. So what you see here is a slice of channel zero. This is, <clears throat> let me just. This is channel one. So these are the axons, by the way. So these are parts of a mouse, mouse brain cell. <clears throat> and then this is the channel two. So just to give you some background, um, what the user is doing is that um, before they, they do the scan on the mouse brain uh, cells, they introduce some chemicals, right? And the goal of the chemicals is to try to stick to axons, okay? Uh, if Julia, if you're here, if I'm saying something wrong, please let me know. Um, but yeah, they, they're trying to see uh, how the chemicals are attaching to the axons, okay? So in her term, she calls this co-localization. In my world, it's just intersection, right? So conceptually, what I want to do is do a segmentation of the axons here, okay? Get the segmentation, and then do a segmentation of, um, let's say, chemical zero. And then once I have the, the label field for both, I just do an intersection, right? I can do an arithmetic operation. And that's where the intersection is, and then I can measure that. And that's what I'm gonna do. Now, <clears throat> um, fortunately for this, um, and I'll just do one channel, you can do all channels. Um, I mean, I'll just do channel zero, so that chemical and the, the axons, okay? So of course you can do channel two as well. So for channel zero, um, I would actually just do thresholding because um, as you can probably tell, or as the user told me, the, the high intensity values is where the chemicals are concentrated, right? Which makes sense. And I won't even go to the uh, segmentation tool. You can actually just use a module. There's an interactive thresholding module that Tom showed in his um, workshop before. And you can do thresholding here, right? So let's say I'm okay with this. I just click apply and boom, right? Again, if you're the domain scientist, maybe you're more careful in picking this threshold, but for the demo, let's say I'm happy with this. Um, so this is actually now the 3D segmentation, right, of this chemical. So you can see where this chemical is concentrated in 3D space. Now, I want to segment the neurons. Um, for this one, I'm gonna go to the segmentation editor because I wanna show you a nice feature and uh, let me just zoom out. Again, I'll use thresholding here. 
I kind of know that 60 is a magic number. Um, yes. Yeah. Okay. And boom, you see kind of already the elongated structures, right, of the axons. Super nice, beautiful. But now, um, if you look at the, the segmentation, there's these tidbits here, right? That maybe it's noise. Um, because I know as a domain scientist that the axons are these elongated things. So maybe I want to remove those small things, right? So you can either denoise the data or um, if you just, let me just add this to the segmentation. There's actually these options here on top that I didn't talk about yet. Uh, let me just change the color. Okay, so there's this segmentation menu here that performs some things, some operations, right? Like fill holes, if you want to fill the holes of your segmentation, remove islands. So islands are these tiny uh, regions that are alone in space. You can smooth the segmentation. But for now, I want to do this remove, okay? So here you can specify the size of these things that you want to remove, right? So let's say uh, I want 50 and I do it in 3D. I do the counting in 3D. So before I remove them, let me highlight them first. So I wanna see a preview, right? And before I delete something. Yeah, so it's telling me that all of these things will be removed, right? Which is maybe fine. Maybe I can make this even bigger. So again, you're the domain scientist and you can keep refining your, your segmentation. Right? So let's say I'm okay with this, I say apply. And now if I look at my segmentation again, um, okay, maybe I do more, because I wanna see the, the nice branches, right? Let me just do one more, let's make it to the extreme. Okay, so let me remove this. Okay. Okay, now you kind of hopefully see the, the structures better. <clears throat> okay, now let's say I'm happy with this. So now I have the segmentation of, oh, okay. Um, Okay, so here's the thing, right? Remember when I told you, like when you do the segmentation, so when I actually did this segmentation thing, a viso uh, overwritten the, the segmentation I did before, right? That's why I told you like here, you probably wanna click new, <laughs> right? To create a new one. So anyway, it overwritten the, the old one, so I'm gonna redo this again. So what you have to do, go here, and remove this master to detach it and then redo that threshold. Okay, so now I have these two segmentations, right? So let me show them side by side. Okay. Yes, so now I have um, I have the neurons on the right and the chemical concentrations on the left. But what I wanna see is where these two meet, right? Where they intersect. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna attach an arithmetic operation. So that's gonna be A. And then for B, I can either go to the drop down here or just click here, input B. Boom. And now for the expression, what do you think we should use, right? So we want to get the intersection of the ones in label A and the ones in label B. A times B, right? So if you have a one on A and a one on B, if you multiply them, you get a one. If you get a one here and a zero here, multiply, you get a zero. Zero here, one here, multiply, get a zero, right? And if I just click apply, 
boom. This is now the intersection. And <clears throat> just like before, I want to do the analysis on this one because that's bottom line what I'm interested in. Did that make sense? So if you now want to do the other channel as well, like the other chemical, you can do the same thing, right? Like do the thresholding and in this arithmetic, it's gonna be A times B times C. If you want, like where all these three uh, intersect. So now again, you have a list of, um, let me just, I wanna show you. <clears throat> So this is kind of where the, the regions intersect, okay? And these are the, uh, the volume, okay? Make sense? All right. So what else did I wanna say about this? Um, okay, let's move on. All right. <clears throat> cool, perfect. So the next um, data set um, it's from Daria here, and okay. I actually cropped out a small region from her whole data set because it was pretty big. Um, and can you see it here? If you look at the, okay, so here there's two materials. Let's say material A and B. Uh, so let's say material A is the dark one and material B is the bright one. And I just want to separate those and see the 3D structure of material B, okay? Um, so first, as usual, I would look at the data set first. So I will use the slice. So here, so for example, I'm not sure if you noticed, but there's kind of jumping, jumping around of the, the slice, okay? So in some cases, it's, it's pretty bad. In some cases, it's, it's okay. But you kind of notice it, right? Um, now, of course, you can do segmentation on this one. Um, but uh, in many cases, aligning them first makes a lot of sense. Because then, like, if you do any filtering in 3D, that would give you better results. So for this case, I just wanted to show you um, that there's a, if you just search for align, there's an auto-align uh, module in Aviso. And if you just click that um, and click apply, it will align them. And uh, this is your, related to your question before, right? Like you have these two um, options here for the output size. So do you want to keep the size the same as the input? Because if you align images, you can imagine, right? Like one can be like move, can move that way. So if you want to keep the size of the input, it, it'll have to crop out stuff. Then the other option is maximized, where it will extend the, the resolution of the image to cover everything. Yeah, let's do maximize. <clears throat> so I'm gonna do that. Um, yeah. So this will take, okay, it's not too slow. But if you have like a big data set, right, this can be a bit slow. Um, Another thing I wanna say while this is running, again, this is trial and error. Sometimes you get good alignment, sometimes not. So if not, one thing that I would try is I would apply a filter. So I would uh, denoise the, the data set. Um, and then try the alignment again. Because the, what the alignment algorithm does, as you can imagine, is it looks for features like edges, right? And tries to align them and minimize the error between them. Yes, so there's a, so this one is the auto align slices. So from the name itself, it's more automatic. The, I forgot the name of the other one, probably align images or something, where you have some manual uh, input, uh, where you can align two data sets to give it like a good starting point. And then uh, when you click apply, then it will. And there's also option to do this for two volumes. So for example, you have uh, 
two scans of the data set. One is, let's say, with the 70 micron. Other is like, I don't know, uh, 30 micron. You can align them if you want. Right? Okay, so now let's look at the aligned data set. I mean, no, I'm not sure if it's obvious, but you see the, the boundary outside, right? It's Yeah, that's a good suggestion, but there's actually a problem in this data set. So if you look, it's pretty thin. So the, let's say the, the, we only have very few slices, and the gap in Z is a, uh, yeah, we don't have enough samples in Z. So this is related to the, the thing that I wanted to show for this example. If you do volume rendering, <coughs> I mean, you don't really see much. Right? So this is kind of related to what I wanted to do. Um, yeah, so there's um, 105 slices, but the, the gap between them is the problem, right? So what we can do is here, so if you go to the data set, <coughs> click this. Um, I think transform editor should work fine as well. You can rescale the the Z, I think, scale factor. Let's try this. <clears throat> yeah, so it kind of stretches it. I mean, you can stretch it as much as you can, but I mean, it depends on your data. If it's smooth enough, maybe it looks good. If not, yeah. Um, and okay, let's adjust the transfer function. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so you can. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But um, in, in some cases, you would still have, in some cases, right? Like you would have, I mean, like the cell data set that I'm going to show after this, you really have much, much lower resolution on Z. Like you have, I don't know, let's say you're, X, Y resolution is like 1K by 1K, and then you only have 30 slices, okay? And for that, I mean, there's really not much you can do. So one hack that we kind of did with this data set was also resample. So that means you, you artificially increase the resolution in Z, but there's, uh, you're making assumptions there, right? Like you're making assumptions that your data is smooth. But maybe you see the structures better. So anyway, um, so I have to go to the other data set, but um, now, for example, after we do the alignment, we can do denoising and then use thresholding to get some pretty nice results. But the main thing I wanted to show here is the alignment, okay? So I'm gonna skip the segmentation part <coughs> and move on to the last one for the cows data sets, all right. So this data set is from um, uh, Steven from the Imaging and Characterization Collab. Uh, ah, actually, you have it. So you can follow along if you want. So it's this cell.lif file. And, yep. So again, just like the, the Axon data set, this one is also multiple channel. But in this case, there's four different channels. And <clears throat> one nice way to just quickly have a look at the data is click on the topmost uh, object here and click volume rendering. <clears throat> this will take some time on my slow laptop. So this data set has four channels and it's, um, it's also fluorescence, fluorescence microscopy uh, of a, of some cells, <laughs> um, and okay. So yeah, my laptop is, is getting slower because right now it's trying to do volume rendering of four different materials, right? So it's running the volume rendering algorithm four times. So, but you see nicely the structure here already, right? So if you wanna figure out what the colors mean, you can click the top object here, 
So blue is the first channel, green, yellow, and red. And you can adjust the, the ranges you're interested in here. <coughs> so yeah, you, you get the idea. If you, want, you don't want to see some intensity ranges, you can uh, take them out from this range. Anyway, so yeah, for this data set, what would uh, a domain scientist want to do? Maybe, let me just turn this off. <coughs> Maybe one is to quantify the nucleus, right? So if I just look at the ortho slice, um, and let's say, okay, I want to quantify the, the nucleus. How many are there? Um, what's the, the volume, let's say? So how do I do that? So of course you have to check your data, right? I mean, and, and your, the different channels are capturing different, let's say different um, perspectives of the data. And obviously like this one probably makes a lot of sense to process for the nucleus, right? And I mean, I won't go through the process, but for this one, it's really a simple, um, let's say uh, median filtering and then thresholding, and then you can get the nucleus. But what I'm more interested in here are the, um, is this channel, right? So let me just, so here, uh, yeah, I think you can see it from the screen. It kind of captures this, these fibrous structures, right? I don't know what they're called, but um, maybe you're interested in those, right? Maybe you want to kind of um, extract them from the data. And I mean, just by looking at this um, slice over here, you can imagine it's, it can be pretty tricky to do that. Um, <coughs> If you just use thresholding, so let's let's try that quickly. So if you try to use thresholding, it's it's very tricky to pick the let's say the right <coughs> threshold value. I mean you get something, right? Which is it's it's not so bad, but it's not complete, right? I mean it's it's, it's actually it is not so bad. <laughs> Um, and you can probably post-process this, right? I mean, if you want. But, um, or you can also try the, maybe the texture classification, right? I would try that as well. But, um, yeah, you can spend time using Aviso trying to get these structures out. Um, in some cases, maybe it will work. In some, maybe not. So in these cases where Aviso doesn't work, like let's say I tried for two hours, and I don't get anything that I'm happy with. Um, for me, personally, that's the case where I want to try something else, okay? Um, so that something else could either be um, deep learning in Aviso. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to squeeze in uh, this part, and I didn't have like a, well, I have this example data set from Aviso, but if you're interested in using this deep learning uh, in Aviso, please reach out to us. But the idea here is kind of similar, or it's very similar to the texture classification uh, tool. You need to have a lot of ground truth, right? So this is, um, let's say, uh, the ground truth here is like manually or semi-manually uh, segmented data that you know is correct. And you use that to train a, a deep learning model. In, in this case, it's a UNET uh, architecture. You train on your ground truth and then try and apply it to new data sets, okay? So personally, I don't have much experience with this, but I've tried it the past few days and sometimes it works, okay? The key here is to have good, really good ground truth data. But if you don't have really good ground truth data in the first place, okay, then I would use uh, Elastic, okay? So <clears throat> before I go into Elastic, just to give you a quick conceptual overview, again, it's very similar to texture classification in Aviso. It's actually kind of exactly the same. So you, uh, you uh, define your materials, right? So in this case, uh, let's say empty or void plus the, the fiber. So I only have two materials. And then you also provide brush strokes, right? So you have to tell uh, Elastic the, the, where the fibers are and where the, the voids are. 
and then it, it runs the texture classification and you can export the result back to Aviso and get something like this. Probably not much better uh, than the, well, it's slightly better than the, the just using thresholding. And just like texture classification, it depends on how much effort you want to put in. So the more data, the better. Um, but it's also, you have to be careful. Uh, it's an art, right? So it's, it's good to also do brushing on, along the edges so it learns about the separation of material. Anyway, so let me, uh, let's get into that now. So if you want to follow through, you can because you have the data. Uh, but, okay, I mean, let me just start Elastic. <clears throat> so if you have Elastic, you can start it now. Um, but don't close your Aviso project. <laughs> Sorry, I, I should have said that before. Why? Because um, the, the file format that we have is this LIF format, right? And this is what the microscope uh, outputs. So Aviso can, can read this easily, but I think Elastic cannot. <clears throat> so if we go to Elastic and go to pixel classification, so, okay, it, you have to save the, the project right away. Um, I'll just save it here in downloads. Yeah, so the first step is opening your data, right? So there's actually a nice step-by-step -step guide here. So one, input data, two, feature selection, three, training, four, prediction. So let's open a data set. If you click add new, um, you can either add separate images or in our case, it's an image stack, so I would click this. And if you now select file and you go to the data set file, uh, data set folder, it can't find anything. So these are the formats that it um, by default supports. <coughs> so it doesn't support the LIF format, obviously. So what we'll have to do is go to Aviso. Uh, should have given you the exported version, but anyway, go to Aviso um, and click on the channel, channel three. Click on this uh, circle here. And here, this is the export icon, right? I mean, it's a bit hidden, but um, once you know it, it's easy. And now you can export it, probably better to create a folder. And then in the save as type, this is the nice thing, you have many options. Um, but for us, um, let's say 2D TIFF, and then just save. So now if you go to that folder, you have this nice image stack uh, that you can use in Elastic or other software, okay? So if you didn't get to follow that, click on this, channel, click on this icon, and then export, okay? All right, so now we can go back to Elastic. Open the cell folder, and then just select the images. And um, one thing you want to change here is this one. So it says stack across time or Z. So in our case, Z. I don't know what C is for, then I would click okay. So if it's time, it's uh, gonna treat the images like as one slice and then multiple time steps. So let's click okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's the first one, yeah, pixel classification. All right, so now we have the data set here. And I mean, it looks like this. This, I mean, for those who are doing the hands-on, hopefully you're also here by now. Um, and the next one we want to do, so we're done with the first step. The next one is feature selection, so click here, step two, and click select features. All right, so um, 
I won't go into the details here, but basically, okay, first of all, I would click these to 2D. So, um, these are the, the okay, the, the features that the, the classification um, algorithm uses to distinguish between um, different materials, right? And instead of talking about them, let me show you what that means. So for now, just check everything, okay? So what each check means here is when the, the algorithm runs, for each check, it will compute uh, an image from your input data. Um, and it will compute some numerical features, yeah? And I mean, we can visualize them later. So let me just click OK. So the, those features are listed here. And if you click on one of them, so you see my image change, right? If you want to visualize each of them, so here you see it change again. So they're computing different things. Some are computing like how strong an edge is, um, the intensity value, um, whatever. There's a lot of features, right? So, so all of these are, are the features. Um, and what you're doing when you're checking all of those is just saying, you know what? I have a lot of compute power. I'm willing to wait a lot of time. Let's just try all of them, right? So if you have the resources, go for it. Try it. But if you're limited in time and compute power, um, you want to be more careful in doing this. I'll talk about uh, a strategy you can do uh, later on if you want to better pick just the features that are important. But for now, I just select all of them. And then I go to training. And now comes the brushing part, right? So you can zoom in here. You have to click plus. Zoom in and zoom out, plus, minus. And then to move around, you have to um, click the mouse, the middle mouse button or the scroll button. And then you brush. Um, so by default, there's two materials here. So you can, just like in Aviso, add more if you want or delete. Uh, in this case, I just want two, right? So first label for, um, let me do, okay, first label for void or air and then label two for the fiber. So now I'm gonna start brushing. And just like in Aviso, it's up to you how much time you want to put into this. And you can change the brush size here. So for the void, I wanna select both the, and you can also select the slice you wanted to do with this in. Um, so a difference with Aviso is here, once you brush, it automatically gets added to the segmentation. Um, <clears throat> there's no like plus button. Now, if you make a mistake, there's a, an eraser here. So you can just erase. So, um, there's that, and I'm also gonna brush, oops, inside. Okay. And now I'm gonna do the fiber. I probably want a smaller uh, brush, and maybe zoom in more. So again, it depends how much patience you have, and how much time you want to put in this. And yeah, you can use the scroll bar to move around. And just like in the texture classification, there's a live update option here. If you want to see a preview of what the result will look like. Okay. So this takes time because I put in so many features, right? So, <clears throat> okay, I mean, pretty nice, pretty decent. Um, and as I said, you can take as much time as you want in, in making brush strokes. For now, let's say I'm happy with this, okay? Later, I'll show you the result that I, where I spent like, I don't know, 10 minutes or five minutes brushing. 
Um, but let's say for now I'm okay with this. Now you get to the next uh, thing, which is the prediction export. So now you want to do the training or the, the segmentation. Um, so here, <coughs> so you can compute different things. So it could be a probability. Actually, I've never tried this. But what we want is the simple segmentation, right? So this is really just like in Aviso, you get a value of one, I think, for label one, and a value of two for label two. It doesn't start with zero, I think. We can check with it. Um, and then change the export settings. Um, so here, if you want to po post-process the segmentation, you can do that here. Uh, and the format is important. So we want a format that we can easily uh, open in Aviso, right? Because after segmentation, maybe we want to do analysis in Aviso. Um, and <coughs> My go-to are either PNG sequence or TIFF sequence. So don't confuse that with just PNG and TIFF because those are just single images. You want a sequence because it's multiple. So I just go with, the, let's say PNG sequence. You give it the folder where you want the output. And then if you want like a special naming convention, it's up to you, but I'm okay with this. Um, so I just click okay, and then export all. And this is gonna do the processing. <clears throat> and if you go to the folder, yeah, so it's outputting the, the result over here. And let's say this is, once this is done, I can go back to Aviso and import that image stack, right? So I can open data. <coughs> uh, I'm gonna cheat a little bit here and open some results that I did a uh, long time ago. So here, just a side comment, this is what Tom was talking about, right? Like if you load an image stack, you can change the voxel size here, like to, you would know this, right? It, it, it depends on, on, on your image parameters. So if you want to increase the, the gap in Z, you can do that here. <clears throat> so, okay. Now, this is the, the, the image stack that I got from Elastix. And I mean, let me turn off everything. Um, what you will notice is if you look at here, the data set info, yeah, you can see it, it says grayscale, 8-bit unsigned, right? Um, and if you want to do uh, the analysis here on your like segmentation analysis, it's not gonna work. Because it interprets this as a grayscale image, so what you have to do is convert it to a label image, so just click here, convert image type, and in the output type, you have to do 8-bit label. And then, uh, so clean labels, if you check this, um, it will subtract one, okay, from the values here. Because, um, yeah, I mean, it, it depends on the segmentation tool that you use outside of Aviso. They might interpret zero or, or the values differently. So in our case, um, <coughs> I think, Zero, yeah, so zero was assigned to the outside and one was assigned to the, the, to the, the, the fiber, so I will not do that. Yeah, so now you have your label field. And if you do a voxelized rendering, okay, let me just, yeah. So this is, my result from Elastic, okay? So this is kind of, I know, yeah, you have to kind of switch back and forth between Elastic and Aviso, but for many applications, like more complex applications, uh, Elastic works great. Uh, and if you ask me, like, how do I know which should I use for my data set? 
uh, for me personally, I use a, try to use Aviso first um, and try like the simple things, going to the more complex. And then if everything else fails, I go to Elastic. And sometimes after I use Elastic, I go back to Aviso and can do post-processing, right? So I can be even improve the segmentation using Aviso. Let's say I use Elastic for the initial segmentation and then use Aviso for watershed. So again, uh, you have these tools, you can kind of experiment and try to figure out a, a nice workflow for your data set. Um, and the good news is if you have, for example, for Julia, we, we, we figured out like a nice workflow for one data set, but she has like, I don't know, hundreds of other scans. Uh, we were able to automate the, the step of um, the segmentation and analysis so that she can apply the process to, to all the other scans um, really quickly, okay? Um, so yeah, that was elastic. Very nice. We're sorry if I'm too quick. Are there any questions right now? Um, no questions? Awesome. You all look so excited and happy. I'm, I'm glad. Um, but yeah, so we're 30 minutes early, which is good. So uh, I think um, before we go into the break, I just wanted to say, um, that hopefully by now you kind of have at least an intuition, right, of how this workflow uh, uh, happens and at least have an idea of the basic tools, brushing, thresholding, watershed, texture classification, um, because these will be your, um, yeah, these will be your tools, right? And, and you can mix and match them. And with Abviso, you have the different filters to denoise data, to align slices. There's many other things, right? And um, what I'm saying is uh, it's, it's pretty exciting, I think, to try to come up with a nice workflow for your particular data set. Uh, and if you need help, let us know. I mean, that's, that's part of our job. Do you have a question? Yes. So the, the brush strokes, that's a good question. So the brush strokes that I did, um, Aviso, or you can actually save those as a segmentation uh, data set. And then you can, um, yeah, yeah, and then you can just reload it. And then for your other scans, you can reuse it. Uh, that's a good question. So that's the nice thing. I mean, that's what I like about Aviso, right? I mean. There's a lot of freedom in a sense, like in terms of what you can do or the, the different workflows. Um, like for example, for Julia, for the Axon data set, because her scans are relatively like consistent in terms of the intensity values across scans, the, the thresholding parameters just work quite nicely across all the data sets. That's why we were able to automate the, the whole process for her. And um, before we get into the break, I just want to introduce the next part of the workshop, which is running Elastic on Ibex. So James will talk about it, but uh, this is mainly if you have really big data sets that maybe don't even fit on your uh, computer or take hours or days to, to process, okay? Are there any other questions before we get into the break? So this is the last part for me. Awesome. So yeah, let's go into a 10 minute break. We'll start a bit early for the last part and we'll end early, which is great. All right, thanks everybody who stuck around. I know not everybody is, is uh, concerned yet about big data, but one day they will be and they will, uh, they'll have lots of questions. So to, uh, to move on, Ronel did a great job introducing all of these tools and motivating, motivating us on why they're important. So what I'm gonna do now is we're gonna talk about doing 3D reconstruction with Elastic, but doing these on really large data sets and how we can do that effectively, quickly, and not waste all of your time. So some initial resources, you already know these, uh, most of these. 
So you can contact Ron L or I, you can contact the uh, Viz Lab with any general Viz Lab questions, and there's a lot of different uh, documentation on Elastic, BG, and, and other things that you can check out later on. So an overview of what we're going to discuss in this presentation. We're gonna start off with a look at some pixel classification challenges and some of the available resources we have around KAUST, and then we're gonna do a hands-on session um, of actually doing this. We're gonna do this on IBEX, so it's our, our research cluster here on campus. We'll do our initial setup. We'll create our training project, add our brushing examples, do the segmentation, and then finally we'll view the segmentation. So what are some of our challenges, and what can we do about those challenges? So the challenges that we have with uh, pixel classification is it can really require beefy systems. So if you're using small image stacks, it probably doesn't, doesn't matter that much to you. But if we're talking about hundreds or thousands of images, now we're using lots of memory, tens to hundreds of gigabytes, and this can really vary depending on your stack size and the number of features you're trying to detect. And the more brushing you do, the more features you try to detect, just the more resources you're gonna need. And then again, this requires lots of CPU cores. So some running even just these images that Ronel was showing today, it was taking his laptop tens of seconds just to, just to do these computations. Imagine doing that, imagine doing that with many more features on uh, thousands of images and then doing that on dozens of different data sets. Now you're, you're using a lot of time. So on serial systems, this takes, this just can take forever. So where then can we get adequate resources around KAUST? So your laptops and desktops in this case probably aren't gonna cut it. You can buy a dedicated workstation, that might be great, but these are expensive and probably a temporary need. We can use the IT remote workstations, and so these are great in that you have a lot of memory, you have a decent number of CPU cores, and uh, you have them available right now. You can just log into them through the web. And these are a really good option if you don't really need to parallelize your computations. So if you're working on more, more of a medium-sized data set. But what is our other option? So the last option then is the IBEX cluster. And so this is a shared resource batch processing compute cluster here on campus if you haven't used it before. And so what batch processing means is it means that our jobs are submitted to a central queue and then the, uh, all the different nodes pick up those, those jobs and run them. And so there are a lot of different nodes in this system with many varying uh, different types of architecture and a lot of different resources. We have CPU nodes, we have GPU nodes, and all different kinds of CPUs and GPUs. So why then do we care to use Elastic? So mainly, because it supports this batch processing mode for pixel classification. We can break up these thousands of images into, an, into many different jobs and run them concurrently. And then finally, IBEX just has tons of compute power and memory. For example, so we had one image stack that came in that had uh, 5,500 different images in it at 1,820 pixels squared. And so this, if you were gonna run this on your workstation, each image with the uh, number of features we were trying to detect was taking about 1.25 minutes. So multiply that out, you're talking about 4.8 days sitting there waiting for this one image stack to run. However, we run this with our pixel classification uh, workflow on IBEX. It launched 800 different jobs and each of those took around nine minutes to complete. And it was, at that time, the queue was fairly empty so we were running 70 jobs concurrently and we were done in under two hours. So you're saving days and days in this, in this case. And that was just with one segmentation of one image stack. So imagine if you messed up and you wanted to go back and redo that, that segmentation. You're waiting another week. So, so doing these with large image stacks can really be time intensive. And so if you have never used IBEX before, there's a lot of different trainings here at KAUST about how to use it and uh, what, what is available on that system. So please check those out. And you can always email the IBEX uh, support team if you need any help with, uh, with the main running of IBEX. So in, K in the KVL, we manage the actual workflow that runs on IBEX, so, so the, the actual pixel classification software. All right, so let's move on to some different, let's move on to the hands-on session. And so our hands-on session today is gonna be composed of four primary parts. Each one you can see here, we're gonna start on IBEX, and then you can do the uh, second step on the IT remote workstations, or you can do it locally if you have all the software installed on your local system. We'll go back to IBEX, and then we'll come back to the IT remote workstations. And so I'm gonna start, I'm gonna use the IT remote <coughs> workstations today just because it's, it's easier and I have a Mac, so I can't run a Viso on, the, on this, uh, this Mac. So I'm just gonna use the, my workstations. It'll be easier that way. So to start off with, we'll move on to IBEX. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna copy our data from the uh, IBEX scratch 
and we're going to create our Elastic project. So go ahead and first thing you want to do, log into Ibex. So open up a terminal. You can, if you're on the IT remote workstations, you can do this all through the IT remote workstation, so it's very easy. And so we'll open up our terminal, and we'll simply just log into Ibex, which I already did. So. All right, so open your terminal, log into Ibex, so SSH, maybe I log in so we can get into the CPU nodes. Okay, and then once you're on Ibex, what we're gonna do is we are going to go to the scratch, so that is CD forward slash Ibex forward slash scratch, and then your username, and that'll get you into your scratch folder. And we are going to do a module load elastic. So do module load elastic, and that what that's gonna do, once it tab completes, is load elastic on Ibex. So now we have all of our Pixblast uh, stuff available. CD to the yeah, scratch. so CD to your scratch. So CD forward slash Ibex forward slash scratch forward slash your username. Okay. All right, so once we're on Ibex, we already logged in. And so how then do we access the image stack? So to access the image stack, we're gonna go ahead and set this variable called images. And so this is the only hard part is where we're copying the images from my, my scratch. So go to your terminal, if I can get back to where I was, say images equals no space, and then it's gonna be forward slash Ibex, forward slash scratch, forward slash my username, K-R-E-S-S-J-M, forward slash workshop, forward slash, what is it called? 2022-fallworkshop-ruck-filtered. I know, it's a long name. So. That's why we're setting this variable. You only have to do this once, so, so. <laughs> yes. Yes. Correct. And I mean, in this, I mean, these 5,000 images took like a minute, so. It, in that case, yeah, I did. No, he, he just means in general, yeah. So, so I actually have Ibex Scratch mounted on my local computer, so all I did is just copied and pasted on my desktop. So it <laughs> didn't even need to SCP because it was all done behind the scenes. So. Yeah, and, and as we learned from the image characterization core lab, they're walking around with thumb drives right now, so it's, uh, it's, it's, not, it's not great in, in, in any case. Uh, if your data's on Shaheen, then that data's already mounted on Ibex, so that's already available. So there's, there's different avenues to get your data. And I think, isn't data Waha mounted on Ibex? I don't remember if that's true or not. So th there's different avenues to get, to get access to your data. But in the end, yeah, we end, end up having to often copy stuff, unfortunately. All right, so everybody have that variable set? Okay. So we set that variable, and so we'll move and get this going better. Okay. And if you want, you can try your own image stack, but for, for now, I'd try to use this one. So how can I move through my slides? Okay. And so we already did the module load elastic. Uh, something you can do is you can uh, take a look at the readme in our Elastic configs if you want to look at some of the documentation we have there. Uh, most of that documentation I'm going to show you in my slides, so you don't have to do that now. But we do have some documentation on Ibex if you want to see what some of our, some, some of the workflow looks like. And so when you do a module, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to say like the slides are also on the workshop web page. Yes. So if you want to go back to this, you can, you can have it. Yeah, absolutely. Download the slides and then you'll, you'll have the process. 
So there are five different uh, shell scripts that we've, we've written, we maintain in the KBL. And so these are, the first one is pix class dash create projects. And so it does exactly what you think it would do. It creates a segment pro segmentation project from a part of your image stack. And that then we can define what that part is. And the reason we're using the uh, part of your image stack is because we don't want to load 6,000 images into Elastic and, and wait around all day for that to happen. So we're only going to be training on a small su subset of images and then using that to do the full segmentation. The next is pix class dash segmentation. And so this does exactly what you think it does again. It runs the segmentation on your full image stack using the training images that we created earlier. And so we'll, we'll go through all, the, all of these steps here momentarily. And then there's pix class status report. And so this is something you can use to verify how much memory was used on each of your jobs, uh, what the time it took to run each of the jobs. And you can use it also to see how many nodes are currently available on IBEX to get an idea of, of how soon your jobs might start. Finally, there's update segmentation. And so if some of your jobs timed out or crashed or IBEX had an issue, you can run this and it will rerun your segmentation and just only rerun the ones that didn't complete so you don't have to run everything again. And finally, validate, which takes a look and makes sure, make sure everything ran uh, successfully. And so we'll go through, we'll go through each of these in, in turn. So breaking down pix class create projects, so this is the most complicated uh, command that you'll have to run today. And so as an example, all, I, all you have to do is call pix class dash create projects. Don't, don't run it now. We're, we're, we're just talking about the, uh, the, uh, the options. So the first option we're going to talk about is the stack specification. So that's the minus S here. So it's, it's very simple once you break it down. So in our case, it is going to be minus S. Uh, and we'll, we'll do the linking here in just a second to your image stacks. So we'll have your image stack forward slash star dot whatever the uh, image name is. And, and in today's case, it's TIFF, so T-I-F. And these have to be in quotes. If they're not in quotes, then the uh, shell will actually expand this, the, the star, and we don't want that to expand in the shell. We want to have Elastic expand the, uh, the glob. And let's see, next, we have minus T, and so this is where we define our training slices, and so this is the most complicated op option that we have. So what this is doing is this is creating a subset of images from your image stack, and so it's taking it from three different positions. In this case, um, we have range one, range two, range three. And so what you're seeing here is zero to 12. And what that means is it's starting at the beginning of your image stack and taking the first 12 images. So zero means starting from the beginning. So that's what this is down here. And so your start index is a positive number. It's going from the beginning. And so then the last number now is a negative number in this case. So that means we're starting at the end of our stack and taking the final 12 images from our image stack. And then the, if we have floats, so a fraction of an image stack, so 0 0.5. So this is going to the exact middle of your image stack and taking 12 images there. So in total, we're going to have, what, 12, 12, 24, 36 images now in our training stack. And so... We'll go ahead and run this. So the process, we've already done this. We've seeded to your user scratch. Now we're going to go ahead and make a directory called Elastic Pix class demo. So mkdir minus p. If I can, uh, it's not necessary actually in this case, but it creates uh, the directory structure if it doesn't exist. So you can do multiple. Yeah, so I'll show you right here. mkdir. Oops. Elastic Pix class demo, and so this will just create our working directory. And then we can go ahead and cd into that directory. If I can, oh, I have multiple ones called that already. So demo. Okay. And so when the ones were in the demo folder. Now we want to go ahead and do the link. And so this is where that images variable we just created comes into play. So ln minus s. And so this is creating a symbolic link to all of those files that I have. That way you're not spending time right now copying them. So we can put anything in the stack name? Yeah, I'd, I would actually just call it stack. Okay. Yeah, so ln minus s, unless I already I think I copied the whole thing. 
So ln minus s, your images, variable in quotes. Actually, does it need to be in quotes? I don't remember. Stack. And then ll. Yeah, so don't put it in quotes. My bad. Forgot what we were doing. Rn. don't know why it's in quotes in the slide. I guess I should remove that those. Ah, okay, so now you can see oh, that stack points to that, uh, that image stack that we, we linked to a second ago. So now we have our image stack available. So what's the next step? So the next step is we actually do our create project. So we will do the following. So do picks class, as long as you already did your module load elastic, you can actually tab complete this. So you'll see that there are some things already called picks, so picks class. Now we have our five options for picks class, so create project. And then the first option is now to put in our stack. And so this definitely needs the, uh, the quotes. So we do. You do, thank you. Minus S for our stack, and then it's gonna be forward slash star.tif, because these are TIFF images with only one F, not two. And then the last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do our uh, training slices. So minus T, and I'm fairly certain that we have to keep these in quotes too. So then we do quotes here. I'm gonna start from the beginning. I'm only gonna do 10 slices, maybe so it'll go a little bit faster. So zero colon 10 comma 0.5. So we're starting from the middle of the stack colon 10 and minus one colon 10 from the end of the stack taking the last 10 images. And so this will create an elastic project for us. So you'll see it's gonna say it's loading elastic again. And this will take a second and it will create our project. You can ignore these warnings. These are, these are from elastic saying some things are being deprecated in the future so that doesn't matter for us. The part that matters is it says that it has now created our training project. Has everybody got their training project who's following along created? Ronel, who's working for you? It says the file already exists. Ah, I think that's because I did the demo before. Ah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can do a different directory name. <laughs> okay. All right. And so. Again, here's the terminal output. Just ignore all the warnings. The only thing that matters is that it says it's created the project. And so now we're gonna move on to step two. So step two, we're gonna open Elastic. And so I'm gonna use the workstations again. And so in Elastic now, we're gonna create our training examples. So I think I've got Elastic running somewhere. It's just called run Elastic on these remote workstations. And so this will open Elastic. So where can I do that? Do which? So that run Elastic. This, oh, this is being done on the remote workstations. If you have Elastic locally, you can do this locally. Run underscore. Yeah. The other thing that we're gonna have to do now, which is the next most complicated part, is get access to the Ibex Scratch. So currently Ibex Scratch is not mounted. Uh, on anywhere on campus, unfortunately. It's something we hope to fix when Shaheen 3 comes along. We're gonna have some different networking, networking options that'll allow this to be easier. But for now, we have to actually mount Ibex Scratch on the remote workstations, or if you're doing this locally, mount it locally. So on the remote workstations, the actual easiest way that I've found to mount this is using the uh, SMB. So this is server block messaging. And so who actually is, is following along Actually, mounting this, because if, if you're not following along, it. I'm not gonna go through the steps. I got an error. Okay. Um, when I do the SSH, should I have done the minus X thing? Mm -hmm. That it shouldn't. Not have to display. So now let's go ahead and mount the Ibex scratch on your, your remote workstation. So uh, I'd go. Are you gonna show it here? Liter yep, literally follow those commands. So GIO oh. space mount, and then we're mounting the SMB. Yeah. 
that is the actual uh, mounting command on these on these remote workstations for mount it for 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 uh, it, I forget what it replaced. It's it's one of the newer mounting protocols. It's not my normal way of doing things on IBEX, but it was what was working most recently. All right, and so once everything's mounted, we now have access to our data. So run your Elastic. So if you're on the remote workstations, do a module load Elastic, and then run Elastic.sh, and then it'll get your Elastic popped up. And then the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do some training. And so we'll go ahead and go to Project, Open Project, and this will take a second for me because it's looking in my scratch directory. There we go. And that's the wrong scratch directory. We'll go up again. Workshop up again. All right. And so then go into your scratch directory, go into your Elastic Fix Class demo folder, and then you'll see the uh, Elastic project that you just created from the command line. And then go ahead and open that. And then we're just doing exactly what Ronel was showing us earlier. We're gonna do some brushing and get some of our features defined. So we'll sit and pull up this load for a second. And so this data set's interesting because we have a number of different features that we're gonna be looking at. And so all you have to do now is just go back, go down to the training page. We don't have to do anything else. All of your features are already pre-selected. And so we're gonna need four different labels in this case. So my first label, we'll change this to be void, second label. Cylinder, third label sand, fourth label air, and so now we'll do some brushing. So void, that's everything outside of our cylinder. So we'll just do some painting out here. Since I should use my mouse, this will be a lot easier. I'll go along this border somewhat. And that should be plenty for our void. And so then for the cylinder, we'll do the same thing. That should be good enough for now. And so then in this case, sand, it's going to be the darker stuff on the, the lighter stuff on the inside. And that should be good for sand. Air, same thing. That should be good enough. We'll take a look. So then we can do live update and see what it thinks our segmentation is going to be. And since we're only doing this on 30 images, it'll be faster than all 6,000. But they're, they're still wide images, so it's going to take a second long as it actually clicked. Where's the thinking icon? Okay. There you should, they're already pre-select, they're pre-selected for you. Yeah. That is one unfortunate thing. You can change to multiple planes, yeah. Yeah, but here the preview does it on everything. So it's up to you on how you want to fix them. <laughs> that was my exact question. I think it is running just exceptionally slowly. Yeah, I know, it's usually a status bar, yeah. Let's see. 
it gets off the screen. And I don't know what it's doing. That's, uh, that's fun. So maybe... Probably thinking, but we can uh, we can try something else. So I will actually create a smaller smaller example because it runs faster. Try again. Did you get your link done? No. no? Okay. <laughs> All right. This should hopefully. I don't know why it's actually loading sixty images. Go back to training. Here you know the text back system that I showed you before. Um, in Elastic Vision, in Adigo, um, there is this. So in that sense, Elastic can be more sophisticated. First of all, there's no repetition of the instruction. Uh, you don't know the keys. And then you just assume that it works and you know the keys. It's, it's just better because there's more options. Like there's more collateral. Okay, so now it's actually thinking. Don't know what it was doing before. Uh, you've got hundreds of gigs of RAM on those remote workstations, but potentially that you can access. So, at least, yeah. And so then this is done. Excellent. It's it's a a so so segmentation. We'll we'll so so we'll keep it. <laughs> and so what we do now is once you have your segmentation done, you actually go ahead and just save your project. But uh, for some reason, this mounted as read-only, so I'm going to save as and change the name to number two and save it back to Ibex. So we'll let it save. Running extremely slowly today for some reason. Okay, so it's saved it, so we can go ahead and let it finish doing whatever it thinks it's doing.
There we go, it's done. The project, yeah. Okay, so now that we have that saved back to Ibex, we go back to Ibex. And so this is where we actually run our segmentation. So we have it done, we're gonna go back, we're gonna launch the parallel segmentation. So that's very easy. If you wanna see what available resources we have, we can go ahead and run this PIX class status report and see what is currently available on Ibex to run on. Project V. And so in this case, you can see it's saying, uh, I don't have the log file because I haven't told it to run one yet. And right now we have three nodes on Ibex that are ready to run. So it should be fine. And we created a reservation for this workshop that we obviously didn't need since we have so few people. So it'll actually run very quickly. So we have our own dedicated reservation right now. So what we'll do is we will simply run PIX class segmentation. So you pass it in the uh, Elastic project that we just did the segmentation on, as well as the name of the stack. So we'll go ahead and do that. So PIX class segmentation, my project name, which was PIX class segmentation stack two, and then the name of the stack. So stack forward slash star.tif, and this will now launch off the jobs. And so in this case, I only have 150 images that we're working on in this stack, so it, it uh, broke this into 22 individual jobs on Ibex. So right now, 22 different jobs are running, processing a total of 150 images. And so we'll take a look at that right now. And so once we've launched the jobs, we can do SQ minus U, your username, and see what jobs you have running on Ibex. So we'll go ahead and do that. We can see that with, since we have a reservation, I have all of my jobs, 22 jobs running, and we're just gonna wait until those are finished. And so I know from experience, given the number of features we selected in Elastic, even on this small job, these are gonna take four minutes to run. So we don't have to wait, but this is Actually, if you were doing this sequentially on your, your home machine, you're talking four minutes times 22, so it would take a long time. But right now it's all running concurrently, so it's gonna take only four minutes. So that's great. But I have some image stacks pre-done, so we can take a look at those uh, anyway. And while your job's running, you can run that same status report again and pass in the segmentation folder. So this. Uh, when you run your segmentation, it creates a segmentation output folder. And so we can actually check and see if any of the outputs are done. And so what we do is we do PIX class status report, and then we pass it in our segmentation folder. So if you see, uh, these are all of our log files. So we have something called segmentation. That's our segmentation folder. Pass it in the stack name again. and it will go and take a look at these individual jobs, see if any of them have completed, see if any of them have failed, tell you the memory usage, tell you the time it took to run them, and, and all of that good stuff. And so you can see right now, it's saying nothing's completed, I'm missing all of these files, which we expect, because they haven't finished running yet. You have 22 jobs currently running. So total jobs 22, none have uh, completed, none have failed, so that's all good, they're all still running. Yes. Yes. Correct. Yeah. 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 So there's some potential in the future. We're looking at different options to get better uh, graphical output from from Ibex. There's not a lot of great options right now, and, and Elastic doesn't run graphically well through Ibex. So. So that's why we're using the remote workstations. It's the, the safest option to use. And so then again, some of the other commands you can, you can check out later. These are your validate segmentation, make sure that nothing failed, and then update. If something failed, you can just run the update. So while my job is finishing, 
we can go ahead and view our segmentation. So Ronel already showed us some ways to view outputs from segmentations. But another way you can use Fiji if you just want to look at the images. So that's very easy to do. Let's see. So we can just launch Fiji here. I don't remember what it was called. Enter J. <coughs> so we'll launch Fiji on the remote workstations and we can, can view the view the output from a segmentation. And so to do that, all we have to do is we go to File, we go to Import, Import an Image Sequence, and then we'll browse to our folder. And so that's not the one I want. Where's my Up button? There we go. So go into Workshop. I have a Results folder that you can also get access to. And then once these files load, oh, wait, it's loading a folder, not files. So then we just click OK. So you can see it's loading 150 images, and we're going to sort them numerically because they're all stored numerically. And then hit OK. So it's loading all 150 images now. And you'll initially notice that we'll see nothing because, as with Aviso, it's interpreting these as a whole grayscale image with uh, values ranging from 0 to 255 or whatever. So we're not going to see anything yet. So in order to see something, we need to actually constrain the range of our pixels. So we can go actually to, if I can remember where to do this, so image, there you go, adjust, brightness and contrast, thank you. And so we can turn the maximum down, and since we know that we have four values, we can go from zero, I'll go to zero to four, it looks, there we go. And as you can see, this uh, segmentation has a little bit of noise around the outside, but that's something we can easily get rid of if we, uh, if we take a look at this in the Viso. And so then, let's see, then we can scroll through our image stack, see the segmentation. So it actually did pretty decent. But let's go ahead and take a look at it in a viso. And while a viso is loading, this is what we'll end up seeing. We'll see its segmentation like this. And if we do the full stack, we end up with actually something like this. So this is the uh, a, a full segmentation. Let's see. We can make that wider. And it paused. And so this is the segmentation that, that Ron L actually worked on. As you can see, the uh, there's actually an, an, another element in there, the green. So we actually have five different labels in this case. actually very cool data it's very interesting and without without using uh, ibex it was going to take a very long time all right so viso is open so we can go ahead and open our data let's see ibex and we'll go to workshop results A. Mm, there we go. That's the only downside of the, the remote workstations. You get a little bit of extra lag when you're doing this. It's actually not so bad. Surprisingly. It's not terrible. I, I, I expected that if you're brushing, it's going to be delayed. So it's actually, it's actually really bad. It's, it's the worst in this room. This is the worst I've ever seen it. I think the Wi-Fi in here is uh, exceptionally slow, but in our office, it actually works quite well. So there, that's already got us a nice ortho slice. So let's see. What was it? Convert image type, Ronel? Mm -hmm. 
and we'll do a convert image type on it. We'll turn this into an 8-bit label. Click apply. And so now you can see our segmentation. And if you want, we can now go ahead and modify our color table. If I can remember where I'm at. So we'll go to, actually I already have it open. Options, edit color map. And so now we can apply the bandpass filter on this and we can actually filter out some of the stuff we don't care to look at. So if we want to get rid of, say the red, we can get rid of the red. So that's not working properly, uh, is it? Did you not updating is it <laughs> well of course live demos never work properly but let's take a look at the volume rendering of it really quick so in this case it was only 150 images so it's kind of a kind of a thin stack but you can see it's actually already filtered out some of the stuff I think I may, may have loaded something improperly, but. But in, in, in once you get used to the workflow, it's actually a very easy workflow to do. There's just a, a few bit different setup things that you have to do to, to get used to. As I say, hopefully once we get to Shaheen 3, we will no longer have to do any of this Ibex scratch mounting, which is uh, most of the heartache that, <laughs> that you have to do to go through this process. So. It's, uh, it's, it's something that's available. If you have any questions about the, the uh, workflow on IBEX, definitely let us know. It's something that we're continuing to refine and develop and, and maintain. So definitely let us know if you have large image stacks or even just big batches of image stacks that you want to run because this is a very good way to do that. So I think that is essentially all I had for, for working on IBEX. So any questions on this workflow or anything before we Conclude? Cool. Thank you well, very much for coming. That's great. Yeah. Appreciate it. Appreciate, appreciate everybody coming. Great. Yeah. Thank you.